And so that's why we don't hear anything as a general public until 2014, which mm-hmm. is when Hannibal Burris did a set at the Trocadero here in Philadelphia and Dan McQuaid videotaped it um, on his on his mobile phone and tweeted <laughs> it out. And that's really the downfall of Bill Cosby was social media. We're the good doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Kristen. And I'm Dr. Aaron. And you are welcome to our corner of the internet for our conversation about the third episode of W. Kamau Bell's masterpiece, honestly, <laughs> honestly, called We Need to Talk About Cosby, that is in the United States as of April of 2022, streaming on Showtime and therefore also Hulu. Uh, and there are four episodes. We've already talked about the first two. We will also talk about the fourth. We're not just going to leave you hanging. And <laughs> this particular episode is honestly all about the Cosby show, um, mm-hmm. which is utterly fascinating. So we really are just going to talk about the 80s. Um, the Cosby show debuted uh, and then ran through uh, until actually like the night of the LA riots in 1992. So we're going to discuss Bill Cosby's power um, during this time and some of the things that the episode brought up for us and then also that the episode like people reported that it, it brought up for them lots of talk about this balance of black excellence versus who he was behind the scenes and what this kind of all looks like and uh, especially with the amount of enablement that went on on the Cosby show set this became a very poorly kept secret if you didn't know it really sounds like you didn't want to know. Um, mm. And and that is, you were potentially willfully ignorant um, and, and kind of all of that. Um, and I will also say that I have, since we watched the show, I have read this book, Nicole Egan's Chasing Cosby, The Downfall of America's Dad. And she offers some insights that I'll be bringing into this. And I'll also be doing a separate review of that book on Abbey Research Read. So all of that out of the way, Dr. Aaron, where would you like to start? I mean, uh, th- just this episode. Uh, I mean, it, it f- predominantly focuses on the on the Cosby Show, but then it also gets into the '90s, and and we end kind of with with Hannibal Burris's stand up routine. So, like, I was just scrolling through my notes as you were doing that. I was like, "There's so much," but I think we should, you know, start where they start, which is um, in <clears throat> in the 1980s with the start of the Cosby Show. Um, and, uh, you know, it's important to have the context of both understanding the evolution of Bill Cosby, uh, throughout this time, but also the perceptions of black folks and black community and black representation. And they make a point very early on, uh, in the doc, in this episode to remind us of the context of the 1980s in which, we have Ronald Reagan as president and very much a conservative push to present the black family as destructive, broken, and incarcerated and on drugs and on welfare and, and, and. Um, So that is the the larger cultural governmental shift in in how um, black families are being represented. And so again, reminding us how a revolutionary and how uh, important the Cosby show was, although they do make the point later on that as I was checking my notes that um, A Different World was a show about Black people and the Cosby show was a show about a family who happened to be Black. Mm. So like the cultural distinction in terms of how Blackness was represented through the Cosby show, the language that was used, etc., Um, But it all fits into Cosby's model of he is the intelligent, middle class, uh, you know, um, moral compass 
for black folks in entertainment. Um, and that's how he sold himself. And that's, um, you know, how he got to be quote unquote America's dad. Um, but, uh, you know, there were lots of things that, um, I thought were, were good to understand. And, you know, we keep building this case for you and I, as white folks on, on the outside of a lot of these conversations and understanding why it was so hard for so many black folks to believe that Bill Cosby was capable of doing this. And you have to understand the Cosby show and what it represented in order to, to empathize with that. And so, you know, some of the things I didn't know was that the whole house was a monument to black excellence. Mm. Like all of the art that was chosen was by black artists. Like everything was this showcase for the beauty uh, and the talent and the history of black folks um, in this country. And, you know, they were black love on full display at a time when Ronald, like literally the U.S. government was telling you that that's not what black families look like. Yeah. Um, and so much of it was for the white audience, but so much of it wasn't in terms of what the Cosby show was able to do. Um, so for me, I think um, that was the most significant thing for me to understand about the Cosby show culturally outside of the fact that, you know, we've talked about our, our memories of, of watching the show. I remembered he was a doctor. I did not remember he was an OBGY flipping N. I think I thought he was a therapist. I really do. And that his office was in the basement of his house. And, um, you know, this episode gets into a couple of incidences where he uh, harassed and assaulted, um, you know, and, and kind of targeted and then tried to groom uh, a, a couple of actors on the show in terms of uh, abusing them um, and getting away with it. Uh, and you know, he kind of, that, that, so that's, I think the second part of this is, you know, understanding the, the significance of the Cosby show and then understanding how he used the Cosby show to continue his, uh, modus operandi, um, which was the really disturbing part, uh, of this. And, you know, they, they saw the, the story of a woman named Eden who played a cop who had three lines, but got her own dressing room. Um, they talk about, uh, this white man, Scotty, who used to literally procure a woman for Cosby and that there was like a line, there was always a, a row in the audience of beautiful models who were then like led systematically back to his, so for uh, mentoring, for mentoring. So this is kind of like, he's figuring out in a narcissistic and possibly sociopathic way, how his model at, in Las Vegas and Reno can like work on the set of a TV show. Um, but yeah, th those are my underlying thoughts about the Cosby show as it's, as it's significant. What did you want to say about the show uh, for this episode? Oh, I want to talk about the Hollywood piece of it. But first, this is one of my favorite lines is that he's not Cliff Huxtable, but they wore the same sweaters. Yes. And like, he, if like, you see melded those identities. Yeah. yeah. If you see press photos of Cosby from the eighties, he's wearing Cliff Huxtable sweaters. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, which is very, they're very distinctive. I've only ever seen them also on John Maxwell. So, I mean, like <laughs> we all, when you, when you say to an and American like, of a Neil certain Neil deGrasse age, Tyson, I think. Yeah. A Cosby sweater. We all know what that means. Like yeah. he's shorthand. Yeah. Um, so the, one of the things that the book really draws out uh, that the show kind of did and kind of didn't is that um, everyone knew in Hollywood this was happening. And if you didn't know it was happening, you chose not to know. Or he chose for you not to know. I think he definitely guarded Felicia Rashad. I think now, should Felicia Rashad have been asking questions about why all these young women were going to her co-star's dressing room? Yes. We didn't ask those questions in the 80s. We just Cer didn't. Certainly so, not of Bill Cosby. Like, and certainly not of Bill Cosby. That's the point of why he was so good at doing this. Yes. He made it so hard for people to ask questions. And But one of the reasons he did is that the Cosby show financially saved NBC. <laughs> saved it. NBC saved it. was the first television show. It started broadcasting 
I think in 19, November of 1949, and it's been continually broadcasting ever since. But why do you think that The Cosby Show and Seinfeld and Friends are lionized the way they are? They saved NBC. Mm -hmm. um, those three shows and Cosby was first. At one point, the average viewership of The Cosby Show was 65 million people. To give you some perspective, that was a quarter of the U.S. population in the, in the 80s. One quarter of the United States. That's more than any Super Bowl. That's more than, that's more, gosh, than Global World Cup viewership in terms that's of massive. percentage. That's like, massive. We all watched The Cosby Show, which then meant, if you want to draw a quick dichotomy here to Harvey Weinstein, who we've talked about in previous episodes, as to why, like, Harvey was a poorly kept secret. No one just could prosecute him for it. Why did the general public not know about it? Because unlike Harvey, who made money for himself and just bullied everybody else, Bill Cosby made a lot of money for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And he was never a bully to anybody but the women he drugged. He yeah. was affable and kind and all of the things. Like, I just think Harvey Weinstein's a, a bully with uh, with no concept of intimacy. I don't actually think he's a sociopath because how he treated those women is how he treated everybody. <laughs> like right, he was, right, right, he was right, a right. monster to everybody. Yeah. Bill, Bill Cosby's brain, we don't diagnose on this show, but seems to be broken. Um, seems to be a little bit different. Uh, seems to be some key FBI profiler uh, nonsense. Um, but he just did it. And at one point, I, I think it's Mark Lamont Hill who says at some point in the 80s, we ha we should have realized that it wasn't Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's all Mr. Hyde. Mm, yeah, it was Jelani Cobb because I wrote it down. <laughs> Apologies. Um, yeah, um, but yeah, I knew it was every... one of the smart men that <laughs> I that I loved. But yeah, I mean, that was, you know, he everything he did was creating an image that was unassailable. Yeah. So you weren't going to question him. He made like, he just made too much money for too many people. So yeah. even the people that did question him, like there's a, there's, you know, we get into the two thousands, especially and more and more young black comedians. When we, sh when Cosby shifts into being a cranky grandpa, yeah. people are much more willing to say things to his face because he's mm -hmm. no longer kind to everybody. Right. So, yeah. you know, he kind of gave up his greatest defense in a certain way. In a way. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, they, they identify that as a, as a huge shift, uh, kind of in the late nineties, he starts to become like grumpy grandpa talking about, um, and going on in like an educational tour talking about like black men and, and yeah. fathers and everything. But before that, I think one of the things that, um, he also understood that they brought up that I didn't know, uh, specifically was that he, you know, he, throughout his career, he used his money and his power for the appearance of making black lives better. I mean, he did probably in a lot of actual fact because he donated a crap ton of money to HBCUs, uh, historically Especially black Spelman. colleges and universities, right? Which is like the, the one for black women, like specifically women's college. So he donated $20 million to Spelman. In the 90s, uh, he donated um, to HBC, uh, you know, they, they said in the documentary that he did so much for HBCUs in the 90s than anybody else in history. And so he positions himself as this mentor to young black women. And we talked about the racial dynamics of his victims. Um, and we were watching it and we were like, did he only, did he only rape white women? Where? And like, you start to get um, more black women in the 1990s as he set up this like mentorship, inverted commas, system um and and you get the young women like eden on the show and lily um who were brought in in as you know actors on the cosby show and then uh assaulted or harassed and so for me you know that's another i just feel like we're collecting you know the the scenes from uh harry potter and the order of the phoenix when they keep putting the orders from yeah. the Ministry of Magic, like Del Dolores Umbridge's educational orders. Like we keep collecting all of these like plaques that say everything that he did that was good. So, you know, and the cynical part of me is so that he could get, get away with doing what he was continuing to do. But for me, it's explaining again, why it was so, so hard for the general public to believe that this was possible. 
And he was, he did that thing that so, serial killers do where he, <laughs> he like showed his hand and expected to be smarter than everybody. Yeah. Because we have the Spanish fly thing, but then there's an episode of the Cosby show where he talks about barbecue sauce yeah. and how whatever he puts in his barbecue sauce makes women horny. And it's like a really, ex when you watch the clip back, like, I mean, I was probably sex five when I saw it the first time. So, yeah. But as a 38 year old, I was like, that is a disgusting skit that I just watched that was on national television. And there's a whole lot of innuendo about how all of the neighbors need Cliff's barbecue sauce because there's something in it he puts to make women want to sleep with men. Um, and like, that's so blatant. Like the Spanish fly bit is so blatant, but because yeah. he did all of this other stuff, he, he is smarter than all of us. And I think that's part of it for him. Uh, when you read the deposition, it the deposition, which we'll get to in the next episode, uh, which I have because I am that person, um, <laughs> he revels in being smarter than everybody. Like, yeah. just revels in it. And we get you know? that um, that story, too, from, uh, I, I don't know if it was, um, it was the... Uh, the woman who is playing the like pregnant um expected oh, Lily. mother Lily yeah. um and she like brings it up on set or or like is, is you know refusing to work with him I don't remember the context of the story but like he delivers a line that that gets a big laugh from the audience and then he like looks at her and says like I told you they like they'll they'll never believe oh, you fooled, or like, he fooled him again Fooled him again. That's what it is. Yeah, I fooled them again. Um, and somebody, uh, one of the talking heads in this uh, docuseries, just said, you know, he's a very intelligent, malignant narcissist. Uh, which is, I think, a great encapsulation of his character. Um, but yeah, he loved the fact that he was getting away with it. That was a huge part of it. Um, that he was smarter that, and everyone else, that he was fooling everyone else. Um, and another thing that they outlined specifically in this episode um was that he had developed a pattern of building trust with the families of these young women mm. and spending time with them and building relationships all so that it would be harder for the women to tell their families and harder for their families to believe the young women uh when they did disclose their assault um which is what larry nasser did for everyone keeping track of yeah. this of how all of these patterns. men look exactly the same yeah patterns yeah um and the the other point that I, I want to be sure and bring up before we get to, like, uh, the pound cake speech and his, his descent into a grumpy, gr grumpy grandpa Bill Cosby um, iteration was that he continued to uh, threaten uh, and manipulate both his victims and would-be victims. And so one of the things they brought out uh, was that women who didn't take the drugs suffered, uh, you know, and, and therefore weren't assaulted, suffered ramifications for their careers. Um, they, you know, they wouldn't get jobs after that. He would spread rumors that they were difficult to work with or that they caused problems on set or whatever. Um, women that did uh, accuse him, uh, at least to his face, of assault, uh, he would threaten them and intimidate them into staying silent. Again, you know, this is uh, the very typical modus operandi uh, of serial assaulters and abusers. So, uh, the, I mean, there was a lot we uncovered with this Cosby Show aspect of it. Um, but I, I want to move move us on to <laughs> grump, Grumpy Grandpa. Uh, so what have you got for that, uh, Kristen? So a couple things happen. In 1997, his son is murdered in a mm -hmm. um, tragic accident that it turns out he was targeted um, for being Bill Cosby's son. And that in 1997, like I remember that happening on the Philadelphia News. It happened in Los Angeles, but obviously he's a Philly guy. So everything that like Bill Cosby did was yeah. big news in Philly. Um, and that was a really big deal. And he was still doing like things but i think for most of like white audience he had kind of disappeared yeah. um after the cosby show he had another show directly after the cosby show that was not nearly as successful um so he kind of disappeared but it sounds like to black folk he didn't because in the late 90s and early aughts he shifted his comedy 
circuit to honestly a lecture circuit. I think he still calls it a comedy circuit, but it's not funny. And it's a lot of lambasting people, and which all culminates in 2004 with a speech that's recorded at the NAACP mm. that is affectionately referred to as the pound cake speech in for reasons we won't get into. But there's... um. And this is also when he really started to lose coherence, to be honest. Yeah. Like, if you want, yeah. like, he is so off the rails rhetorically. Mm-hmm. Like, all of his stuff used to be so tight. Yeah. And we hit yeah. the aughts, and he just no longer makes sense, to be honest. Yeah. Um, and, but it's a lot about how black men are the problem with black communities. Mm-hmm. Um, he does a lot of talking about pulling up your pants, which was, it's a boomer is of the baby boomers. That's like their favorite thing to say about young black men um, is pull up your pants. Um, Talked a lot about how all the failures of, of um, black women to like keep their men and like some really insidious stuff. And all of a sudden we start to get a split in the black community where especially younger folks, comics, especially what we see in, you know, only five years later, there's a recorded evidence of DL Hughley trying to call out Cosby. Um, he gets really, Cosby gets really angry at all the comics using the N word and profanity and talking about sex mm-hmm. and comics start coming back at him with like, okay, well I may talk about this, but no co-ed ever ended up naked in my bed with her drawers on backwards. Like mm-hmm. DL Hughley said, um, of course, all of those tapes are suppressed. Um, and so that's why we don't hear anything as a general public until 2014, which mm-hmm. is when Hannibal Burris did a set at the Trocadero here in Philadelphia and Dan McQuaid videotaped it, um, on his, on his mobile phone and tweeted <laughs> it out. And that's really the downfall of Bill Cosby was social media because yeah. all of a sudden there weren't any gatekeepers that he could intimidate into, he wasn't making us any money. I don't right. need to keep him happy. I can right. hit retweet real fast. Right. Um, He's, he can't threaten my career. He doesn't have anything to do with my career. And I was right. living I was living in Belfast at the time. And I just right. remember, like, reading it over breakfast and hitting retweet. Um, I mean, like, yep. Yep. Okay. Let's let's start this conversation. But, and so this is another thing. And they bring it up in the documentary a little bit. And then I've seen other articles about it, too, where the black community needs to start wrestling with Cosby a li- even a little bit before the allegations come out. Like, who is this man to tell us these things? Mm. Um, And is this the, like, why are you this way? And why are you doing these things? But then a whole lot of people just went, oh, he's just a cranky grandpa. Look at how good he did before. Um, But we do, I I think without the cranky grandpa phase, the allegations would have been even harder for people to swallow. Oh, yeah. So, like, he made, so the steps were like, oh, oh, you might be an asshole. Right. Got it. Um, you might not be Cliff Huxtable. Okay. Right. Because um, I think you're right. I think that was the first time he started to show, like, during the Cosby show years, he had so melded those two identities so that they were indistinguishable. Um, and it it was, you know, the, the pound cake speech. And then he wrote a book, uh, he wrote a lot of them, yeah. Uh, but specifically, like, a book based on what he said in that speech, and he he did a book tour on it. And it was, you know, the first time ever that he had divided the Black community. Um, and you see and, white people being like, oh, well, yeah. all the things we've been saying that you keep right. saying are racist can't be racist because Bill Cosby is saying it. Because Bill Cosby is saying it, right. So then they make the point, too, in, at the towards the end of this episode, that that shifted his audience towards white and elite folks. Mm-hmm. And so he's making some of these arguments in really hostile places for black folks traditionally. Um, and that really felt like a betrayal uh, for a lot of folks, which I can totally uh, empathize with. Um, but I think it's worth pointing out, too, that we learned towards the end of this episode that the first time we get the accusation from Andrew, Andrea Constad is in 2004. So that is the correct. Same, the same yes. time as the, the pound... Uh, cake speech Um, but as you pointed out it took until 2014 to gain real traction because he was able to like suppress so much of of what people knew and what people were trying to say 
And a huge part of that is that the Attorney General of Montgomery County, Pennsylvania, chose not to pursue criminal charges against Cosby mm -hmm. in a very highly criticized decision. There was no investigation. Um, he closed the investigation four months after Andrew Constad's um, complaint and accusation. Explain to me what what uh, exactly what investigation can take place in four months. Um, and he and essentially the, his logic that he says is that he did this because there wasn't enough evidence to get criminal justice for her. And so he closed the investigation so she could sue Cosby. Mm. Fine. We've like that misses. I can see the logic there. That misses the point. Yeah. Like people wanted him off the streets. Like she wasn't after money. This is a very common misconception about sexual assault victims of powerful people. She wasn't interested in the money. Right. She wanted him, she wanted him off the street. She didn't she want him to be able to hurt people anymore. She wanted him to stop hurting people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she does end up doing a civil lawsuit because she had no other option. She does end up settling for a not, an undisclosed sum. She is, they are both bound by very strong NDAs. Uh, so we do not know the terms of that, nor can she speak to reporters ever again. Um, but during that process, for reasons completely legally unclear to every legal expert I've ever talked to, the Attorney General of Montgomery County promises Cosby that they will not prosecute him if he's honest in the civil lawsuits. So Cosby says everything. He confesses. He confesses to ev nearly everything. Now, at that point, there wasn't all these accusers coming forward. He did not confess to harming the Jane Doe's. But he definitely says that he drugged Andrea. And he says that he was getting quaaludes long after the, he was getting prescriptions for them. They were made illegal in 1982. He was getting them up to the 2000s. In 2007, when he did this deposition, he, I believe I read somewhere, I did not read it in the deposition, but I read somewhere that he reported he still had some in his home in 2007. Um, so we have all this evidence and then that's eventually what people prosecute him on and he goes to jail and then it gets overturned because people are like, that promise was made and he said these things in, in faith and we can't do this. So he is guilty of these crimes. Mm -hmm. He confessed them himself. He is not criminally guilty of them though, unfortunately, because of legal proceedings. But 2004 to 2007 is when this precedent was set by the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office mm -hmm. because that is the, he owns multiple homes. His home in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania, which is in Montgomery County, west of Philadelphia, is where he committed the crime against Andrea. Um, and that that's why that was prosecuted there. It's a very wealthy county, which makes it very politically interesting. And this became very political. Uh, and, and you can read about that in the book, but I, that's something else like I remember, I was graduating college and moving home and like all of this was happening and it was really, really weird. But so all of this is happening behind the scenes. He's still on Cranky Grandpa Tour. He's been, you know, credibly accused of this. He's been made to stand trial. You know, like all the, or he's not being to stand trial at that point. But like the district attorney declined to press charges. That's, that's all blah, 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 all this happening. And you get the, you get the feeling from the documentary that black, young black comedians were just getting tired. Yeah. And the joke and what Hannibal said that night on stage, he'd said hundreds of times before. The only difference is that Dan turned his camera on. Yeah, and it left the room. Um, so speaking of leaving the room, I think we will leave this room for now uh, and this video for now, um, having covered Lord uh, all the information that we uh, can possibly handle in episode three. Uh, we will see y'all next for episode four or whatever we see you next for. If you liked this discussion, please comment and engage with us. We love talking about this with each other, but we love talking about it with our, our fabulous YouTube community as well. Um, if you if you like us and you want to hang out with us more, do the YouTube -y things of liking and subscribing and clicking bells so you don't miss any more of our fantastic coverage. We promise we do talk about happy things sometimes. But we very often like to dissect uh, pop culture phenomena and news stories and documentaries around a whole host of issues. So uh, please uh, do all of those things. Uh, join us for our continuing conversations. And if we don't see you next for episode four, we hope to see you again soon.
Bye, everybody.